So we're, uh, we're talking about private boat offshore fishing strategies. Uh, the things we're going to be covering in this webinar is uh, what to know before you go, implementing your game plan on the water, finding signs of life, and using the right technique at the right time. Uh, last week, I was able to fish offshore two days, and I fished two very different scenarios that I'm going to kind of cover with real-time information for you guys here and kind of yeah, neither of them were successful. I saw fish both times, but these bluefin tuna we have out here right now are pretty ridiculous. Um, but I'm going to run you through kind of what I go through and see if we can't get you in the right direction. And the goal of this whole webinar is not so much to tell you, hey, go here, use this, catch that, so much as it is to tell you or to teach you guys the, uh, the way to figure out how to figure out what to do by yourself so you can go out on your own and drive away from the fleet and have some success. So um, I guess we'll get started here. Um, yeah, you know, when I write this stuff, a lot of times it seems a lot more witty or whatever than uh, when I read it live here. So, you know, it's a big ocean out there. Where do you start? Um, one of the really amazing things about the charting software available nowadays, especially with Navionics here, is the amount of detail you can get in some of these maps. And uh, even five years ago, we were operating on much less information than we currently have. But the problem is with all the information we have now, everything looks good. And I'm gonna use my mouse here, and I hope you guys can see it on your screen. It's moving around, it's right in the East San San Clemente right now. So all of these areas that show dark lines, these are ridges or high spots. Uh, some of them, like the 43, come up fairly shallow. Others don't come anywhere near the surface, but um, all of them have the ability to aggregate fish due to the fact that the ocean currents which flow along hit these underwater mountain ranges, basically, even though they're nowhere near the surface. Imagine Catalina Island and how the air, when the wind blows, blows over the island. And some places it speeds up and becomes over a pass. Other places it's blocked by a big cliff or whatever. The same thing happens on the ocean. And what happens is these currents create turbulence and upwelling, which brings plankton and things like that to the surface, which once it hits sunlight, uh, starts uh, primary production. This is very scientific nonsense that you don't really need to know, but I'm going to give you some background here. And that primary production creates nutrients that bait fish eat, which converts that primary production into something that game fish can eat. And the pelagic red crabs we've had for several years now are, are the <coughs> sorry, the biggest link between primary production of plankton and things like that, and transferring that into a food source for tuna or any other game fish. Excuse me. Um, so while the entire ocean has a potential to have fish in it, much of it is dead water, except for areas where there is upwelling, because those areas of upwelling tend to aggregate bait fish, which tend to aggregate Pelagic fish to feed on them. So, my entire discussion here tonight is going to be talking about how the currents are changed by underwater topography, and that creates opportunities for there to be fish in certain places. And while there's often fish in the middle of nowhere, that's a low percentage bet unless you have every day to spend in the ocean. If you are you going to go out once a week or once a month? You're going to want to go to areas that have the highest probability of holding fish. And if you hear about something different, that's okay too. So let's move on to the next slide. So the biggest question always is where do you want to start? And if you look on the chart, it doesn't really tell you a whole lot. You can see where the, the ridges are and all the other things, but it doesn't really give you any indication other than Oh, I heard fish were biting at the 43 or the 371 or the 277. But what's significant about those numbers? Well, we're going to take a look at this week's SST chart, which is sea surface temperatures, and this week's chlorophyll chart, which is the amount of particulate in the water, which is also 
a part of that whole primary production thing because a lot of that plankton that discolors the water. So we're going to go to the slide of sea surface temperatures. Now, I'm sure most of you are very familiar with how sea surface temperatures work, but it's a uh, it's basically the darker the red, the warmer the water. Now, the thing with sea surface temperatures is it's a, it's a sliding scale because there's only so many colors you can use. So in the middle of winter, something that looks red might be eight or nine degrees colder than something that looks red during the summer. So you have to, all this does is tell the difference in temperature. It doesn't tell yeah, it's not like a thermometer. So uh, let's say the, the yellow water here is 60 degrees. The red could be 66, 67 degrees. If the yellow water is 70 degrees, the red could be 80 degrees. So it's, it's all subjective. And every SST chart has a, a legend at the top. And this is from Fishto, which if you guys don't have it, I highly recommend. Um, and it has a slight scale. So as you put your mouse over the different temperatures, you can look at the top and it'll tell you exactly what the temperature is in that area. But we're not looking so much for specific temperatures at these fishing, so much as temperature breaks, because those are usually, if there was, oh, let me back up a second, if there was no current and no wind and no changes in bottom topography, the only thing that would heat water would be sunlight, obviously, and so all of the water in Southern California would, in theory, be the same temperature. The fact that it's not tells you that there's some currents that are happening here, and these currents happen to line up pretty much with a lot of these ridges that I talked about earlier. So I'm using the mouse here again. If you can see, I'm down here in the bottom right-hand corner. I'm going up. There's this ridge that runs from the 371, the 302, all the way up to the 182, 181, all these banks. This is basically the, I guess you'd call it the inside ridge on our offshore bank. This hot, warm water is lined up right on the edge of this because on the other side of that, there is a current change that is cooling that water down. Well, it's not significant. It might just be a degree or two. That edge doesn't, you're not looking so much for the temperature. You're looking for what's creating that edge, which is probably some sort of current variation, maybe a shift in direction or something like that, or shift in speed because those tend to capture plankton and attract bait fish, and as a result, attract um, pelagic species like tuna. And so we're out here looking for basically edges in the uh, uh, water temp. And uh, okay, I'm sorry, I'm just uh, doing a little housekeeping here to make sure I get any Questions if anybody has any, feel free to type them in. Um, the two edges that I've highlighted here are associated with the two areas that I fished. I fished the lower one on Saturday of last week, and I fished the upper one on Tuesday. I'm not, I don't even remember. Uh, maybe Wednesday afternoon. Um, both these edges were holding a, just an incredible amount of tuna. And um, a lot of the water around them was really dead. Um, and again, here I'm using the mouse. You can see I ran the 371 from San Diego, and I ran through a lot of red water on the way there, which is warmer water. But we didn't even see any but dolphins until we got to the 371, which is right on the edge of that colder water break there. And then we saw a lot of tuna. And I heard boats on the radio that were down below there, like the 425, and they weren't seeing a whole lot. Um, or even up at the Hidden, that day the fish were not there. They were on that 371. 371 was pretty crowded, so I worked my way up the ridge all the way up to the corner, and I didn't have the current SST chart when I went out. The day I went out, it was cloudy, and when it's cloudy, you can't get a, a good image. Um, but I had steady water. I think it was 67, 8, 67, 9, somewhere all the way till I got just up out up to the corner where this water temp changes. And then not only did the water drop, uh, you know, two tenths or three tenths or three, all sides of life seats. So those fish were definitely holding along that edge that the current was creating. Um, 
During the week, same thing. I ran out of Newport. Uh, my friend Jimmy Decker went out on Saturday. On his way back from Clemente, he ran over a big school of 100-pound plus tuna off the East Santa Cat. And then a couple days later, uh, my friend uh, Seth and uh, – I'm always trying to blank with his name. Anyway, that horrible. Uh, yeah, there we go. Product gig old. Uh, they ran, uh, Zach, sorry about that. Yeah, thanks. Uh, Seth and Zach uh, ran out to that same area and ended up getting three fish over 100. We went out the next day, and those fish were still on the same edge about, they weren't quite all the way out to here, but they were, you know, four to eight miles off the island, uh, 80 and 100-pound bluefin. And we also found um, just below there, not quite from 277, probably, that halfway there in schools of 40 to 60 pound yellowfin tuna um, that were actually right on the edge. But up there, the water was only 63 degrees, but those fish were still there and still active. And those, uh, those big bluefin were actually associated with a pot of dolphin, which is very unusual for fish that size. And uh, we chased them all the way to the Avalon Bank on the front side of Catalina, basically. And, you know, I hope they're still out there. That's week old dope for you guys. So I'm not really letting anybody's cat out of the bag, I hope. But uh, anyway, there's you know, a ton of other good water all through here, but all this water is barren. And you can see this patch of warm water here um, by the 289 uh, and the 181. Normally, this would be a great area to fish, but this is where the second part of the equation comes into play with the uh, chlorophyll charts. I'm gonna. I think I have that next. Maybe not. So, okay. So I mean, something I should have talked about. Those temperates I talked about. They're lining up with these ridges. I kind of talked about that on the previous slide. But here you can actually see the ridges that are associated with that. This on the inside was a warm water side. The outside was a cold water side. Again, a Catalina. The warm water side on the front side. Cold water side on the outside. So you can see here again. Warm water towards the beach, cold water outside the beach. And that's associated with the upwellings from the underwater ridges. You know, the, uh, at the, uh, the ridge that comes up from the 277 all the way up to the island is, is basically just an extension of the East Santa Catalina Island that's submerged. Um, so those currents start long before they get to the island and have a, a bigger play. But, you know, these are edges are things that will attract fish and aggregate bait and the fish to feed on with their with the current. Um, so on the chlorophyll chart, which is the next step, and I, I, mean, I guess I'll explain this a little bit as well. Um, this is a satellite image that shows the amount of particulate in the water. I think it's by a reflective thing. I'm not exactly sure how they how the satellite picks it up, but I'm using the mouse here. The real clean areas are the blue to almost purple, means just pristine, clear water. The further you get away from there, the dirtier the water is. And so you can see out here on the left side of the screen, that's dirtier water. But that's that's not dirty, dirty water. That's just like, oh, it's a clean blue as opposed to that purple blue, which you'd see here in the middle. Um, once you get into these oranges and reds, that's getting into pretty dirty water, which it'll actually look green. And, Last year, a lot of the tuna we caught, the bluefin, were in really dirty water and they didn't seem to care. A lot of times that's just a surface layer anyway. I mean, we had times last year where you'd have a bluefin on and, you know, 60 or 80 pound fish, you wouldn't even know you were a gap until you saw it eight feet below the boat because you, it was, the water was so dirty. But what I spoke about before about that area here where the water was warm, let me go up again. This warm water area, this roundish blob, there's not going to be a fish there because that's associated. Oh, there we go. That's associated with this off color water. And basically, this you can see this almost looks like a little uh, uh, twister here. This, there was a, the dirtier water that was on the outside kind of came down the front side of San Clemente Island and made like a little gyre right there. So that's, it's warmer, but it's, ugly water and you can see how it has a little tail almost like a little, like a little hurricane or something going through that's because it's spinning through there 
And that's also creating a current that's holding that, that temp break on the east end of Catalina. That's where those fish are sitting inside of it. Um, there's another, you can't really see it too well here, but just off the east end of Catalina, there's another finger of off-color water. But something that's light like that and elongated, um, I wish I had a better image of it. We had just terrible uh, chlorophyll shots to the cloud cover. Um, the edges of a chlorophyll break can also attract bait. I, I guarantee you there's some, some bait stacked up on the edges of this dirty water. Now, whether there's any fish in there or not, anybody's guess because it's just kind of a circulating thing. But if you have a, a streak of dirty water, which basically this area here just goes straight into the beach, it's a line of off color water. That line of off color water is going to have a lot of nutrients in it. There's going to be a lot of bait fish associated with it. And the, uh, that ran all the way across the 14 mile bank. And the amount of whales, dolphins, birds, uh, everything, tuna that were associated with that on Tuesday was just remarkable. I mean, you could look through the, the, the binoculars in every direction, you would see some sign of life. There was so much life out there, it almost became impossible. We had uh, these big bluefin that were associated with these dolphins that were eating, they were eating the same bait. We'd drive through the dolphins, just get huge, just scream filler meter marks. And you, you know, all we had was jigs and poppers and stuff. We'd stay with them, and the, uh, the tuna would come up blowing up on the edge of these dolphins. but. If you didn't get cast on them right away, the dolphins would go through and tear it all up, push tuna out of the way. So, um, but they're all eating that same stuff. And uh, one of the things up and down the coast right now is there's just an incredible amount of bait. My friend John Curry was out, uh, I think Sunday. I don't know when he went out. And he made the loop out of Dana and he ran all through the east, all the way to the mackerel bank and down through it. It's just a bait, tons and tons and tons of bait everywhere. And that's one of the reasons these really aren't biting this year. So uh, that kind of explains that aspect of it. But, you know, if you're going to go out and – so let's talk about looking for areas that you want to go fishing. Um, I'm going to jump down a little bit. I may come right back here. So last Saturday, um, my plan was to go fishing, and I checked with uh, – a friend who had been out uh, the day or a couple days earlier, he'd reported getting some fish uh, down in the general area, I circled down there, which I didn't know when I went down there, but it was the same area that basically everybody was fishing. Um, there was probably 10 or 15 sport boats and as many skiffs and yachts out there, trolling kites and you name it, it's a, a mess. Um, you know, if they're wide open and everybody's stopping catching fish and you can find some fish around there, go ahead and catch some things. But like it was Saturday where fish weren't really biting. No, they weren't. They, nobody's catching them. And everybody's driving around and chopping each other up. I just left. I just ran a couple miles uh, northwest there and found some fish on my own. Actually, I, I ended up sharing them with the uh, San Diego for a while. Uh, neither has really caught anything on. I, I think they hooked a couple. I uh, never came close to by me. It winded into popper or jigs right through boiling fish that just weren't biting. But the area that I intended to go was, was too crowded. And um, I didn't have current SST numbers, but what I did have was a chart uh, that showed me where good water should be if it's there. And you can see in this thing that based on my experience, and that's one of the things too, you have to rely on, on your understanding of things. I knew the fish were biting up at the 43, which is right about uh, here, and the corner, which is right here, this is the corner of the international border thing. Um, I had a feeling that if there was fish up there and there was fish down here, there's probably a good amount of fish along that ridge as well, and we could probably run into them. So, when I took off, I noted the water temperature that I was seeing fish in, because that's really going to be important, because once you get out of that water temperature, something has changed, because it's not, you know, it, water's not going to drop half a degree, even a third of a degree or a quarter degree, unless there's something different going on. So, 
I started heading in a direction. I followed that ridge all the way up, and I, I saw a school of fish, stopped on them here, there, and there's fish scattered through them. They weren't biting either. Uh, but some of the best fish I saw were where there were no other boats around at all. I mean, it was just, you know, we, we'd stop on a kelp patty, the big yellow equipment, and then we'd bait on the boat, couldn't catch it, we're trying different things, and big spot of shear water sitting there, and uh, a couple of turns flew over, and next thing I know there was a, you know, 100 yard foam or a bluefin up. And uh, we slid right into it and made quite a few casts, and got them, I mean, casts that should get bites and they're biting, and uh, they didn't, but uh, we really just, did what we had to do, and that is slow down. Then I'm, I'm let me get back to that. But anyway, so as I'm running up, I got to a point where, and I'm watching my temperature gauge the entire way, and my temperature dropped 0.3 or 0.2 or whatever, and it was like it went from feeling super fishy to feeling not fishy at all. And uh, I'm sorry if you guys joined late, you're doing a hand raising or whatever. Uh, sorry, just go to the, hit the Q and A button and you can type in your question and I'll be able to answer it for you. Um, if anybody joined after we started here, I'm happy to answer any questions as we go. Just uh, there's a Q and A button at the top, just click on that, type in your question, I'll, uh, I'll get to it right away. Um, so anyway, once we got to that area where the water temperature dropped, I gave it the benefit of the doubt and gave it about another quarter mile, but then I turned around and worked back through the zone and found more fish in that warmer water. And it's not that they like the warmer water, it's that they're on one side or the other of this current break. And these, uh, a lot of times the fish would be on the cold side, you know? Uh, it just depends, you need to go out there and figure that out. But uh, one of the mistakes I see guys making as far as it goes to making on the water adjustments is, going out, getting out to the area where they want to fish, not seeing anything, getting out their binoculars, looking for the first boat they see out there, running to that boat. Oh, they're not getting anything. Okay, they're looking, they go run to the next boat. So instead of doing that and running full speed everywhere, slow down. You're not looking for other boats. Other boats can be a good indicator that you're in the right area, but the chance of you running up and then being on a huge foamer that's wide open is, is a pretty slim uh, opportunity. So I have a pair of uh, uh, Fujinon Techno Stabby uh, digitally stabilized binoculars. Um, I'd love to have a pair of uh, gyros, but they're out of my price range for the amount of offshore fishing I do. Um, I have a question here. Okay. So, uh, yeah. So the question relates to how much of a temperature break are we looking for? Um, I'm going to go back one slide. This is a very good question. Thank you, uh, William. Um, so if you're out there looking for areas that are going to have fish on them, you're going to want a hard edge. As you can see here with the mouse, this right here, this red to light yellow and orange, that's a hard edge. On the east end of Catalina, that's a hard edge. These modeling ones, that's not a hard edge. So if I'm going to go and look for an area that might have fish, I'm going to go to an area that has a hard edge. That means there's a, a differential there that could aggregate bait and fish. When, once I get to that area, if the water temp fluctuation is slow, let's say I run for five minutes at 20 miles an hour, and during that five minutes I drop 0.2 degrees, I'm not really going to worry about it. If I'm idling, or if I'm driving, well, you know, let me take that back. That's a, not a good example. If I'm driving 10 minutes and I drop 0.2 degrees, I'm going to start thinking about, ah, uh, maybe I should, I'm getting out of this. If I'm driving in five minutes, it drops 0.2 or 0.3 degrees. That means that's a fairly hard edge. and Whatever I was in, I'm no longer in. That doesn't mean I'm out of fish. That just means that something's changed. So, if I hit a temperature break of more than 0.2 or 0.3 degrees, I'll normally stop the boat and glass around and see if I'm seeing fish where I was or signs of life where I was or if there's more signs of life where I'm going. If there are signs of life where I'm going, I'll keep going. Um, also, if the temp break I find doesn't relate to what I'm seeing on my SST chart the night before, 
I'll give it another mile and see if maybe I just maybe the wind gusted through this area or you know a, a big ship went through and upwelled some colder water from 20 feet down or whatever you know. Uh, so I would say uh, you know uh, to answer the whole question you know a point three degree or more temp rate to me is a pretty significant temp rate. A half degree or a degree is huge, and I you rarely see that in a short line. Um, it'd be pretty gradual. There's there's times when guys are like, oh yeah, a three degree temp rate, but usually that's over like a mile or two. Um, anyway, uh, so talking about driving around and finding stuff, you know, we all dream that hey, I'm gonna get out to where they're biting and I'm gonna find like this big foam or a blue fan blowing a and out of the water to be wide open every cast. It's rarely like that. Uh, when I went up to uh, Catalina this week, we ran out to the numbers. I was on Jimmy's boat. We ran out to the area where he caught his, or he didn't catch any, where he saw his fish the trip before. And uh, yes, the temperature I'm referring to is the uh, surface temperature. That's all, that's the only temperature you can really get. That's the uh, SST is sea surface temperature, uh, Jonathan. Um, and anyone else that's curious about it, thanks for the question. Um, we got out to the area where he saw those bluefin, I mean, almost straight to the numbers, and uh, yeah, um, he gets the glass, all the right there, so we pull up, and there's just a big spot of birds and activity, and it's just dolphin, though, and two fin whales or whatever kind of juvenile whales. Uh, yeah, sorry, Jonathan, one more time. It's uh, sea surface temperature. So, yeah, that is the absolute surface temperature. Uh, when you're talking about water temperature, uh, it drops off fairly quickly. So, uh, you know, while the water temperature may be 70 degrees on the surface, you go down 20 feet, it might be 60. Um, so yeah, you go with the SST chart, and uh, that will uh, that will tell you. Um, anyway, so we we went out to that area, and uh, there was dolphins there, and we drove away from a lot of dolphins, which we learned later was a mistake because we were Stop on another spot of uh, uh Dave. I will uh, get to that a little bit later in the uh, in the thing here. So trust me on that. Um, the uh, we're driving away because we don't normally associate bluefin with dolphins. Um, but that just shows you that you know a sign of life is a sign of life. And we found out later the best school of tuna we saw them was a big school of bluefin that were mixed in with dolphins, and we were sitting there going. We're getting too many meter marks, maybe there's a yellow fin. I don't know what's going on. These fit be big blue fin. It's just more ready to give up. We had like a hundred pound blue fin jump out of the water and mix the boat. So signs of life are signs of life. And the things that are feeding on, uh, you know, be it dolphins, whales, birds, uh, anything, if there's food there for them to eat, there's food there for, for fish to eat. And um, so finding signs of life is, is really what it's all about in the water, but it's rarely gonna be the big foamer like we see here. Uh, on a good day, you'll pull up, and this is from the same. So we had this. This was a foamer bluefin that, that had two baby humpback whales. Had some follow and chili corella. Me and my buddy were there for like an hour and a half, and we only caught I don't know three or four fish. We we lost. We were getting on a cold sniper. I finally we snagged all of our cold snipers on the whale because they would come up in the middle of it. We lost all our jigs. Could catch me a service. I just took pictures. Um, we'll uh. We will see um, birds are a very good sign. And there, you know, there are several types of bird situations you're going to run into. Um, seagulls, for the most part, are suboptimal. Um, if you're not seeing anything else, then seagulls are great. But um, usually terns and shearwaters are the two types of birds we're looking for. Uh, the terns are the easiest, easiest to spot because they, they're flying around and you can see them up high. Um, in the last couple of years, the shearwaters, though, have been the real indicators of where the tuna are because they're, uh, you know, very lazy birds that tend to raft up on the surface. It, you know, they're the ones you see flying low by themselves. Um, if you see a pile of the shearwater sitting on the water, um, they're going to be sitting on a bait ball that is coming to the surface periodically, or they wouldn't be sitting there grouped up like that, especially if they have to swim to keep up with it. Um, that means that every now and then, some tuna or dolphin or something is coming up, pushing this bait ball to the surface and these shearwaters are feeding off. 
So if you find a spot of shearwater sitting underwater, it could be 10 birds, it could be 100, and you see a, even a couple of turns flying around over it, there is a very good chance that uh, there's going to be some fish happening there soon. Uh, turns are not lazy. They're, you know, they're, they're not like seagulls that will eat like something popcorn and just all kinds of junk. You know, I, I know that's not appropriate offshore, but seagulls are scavengers. Turns are actually hunters, which go out and actually actively look for, for fish to catch and eat. And uh, a very good indicator with uh, turns, if you see real high flyers, that means if they're looking, you know, they could be not just flying straight, but they're circling and they're come right going up and down in the uh, airspace above the water. Those those turns are looking at fish, and the, the higher the turn is, the deeper the fish is. So what these turns are trying to do is they're trying to stay high, so they can keep a, an overall view of everything. But they're as the fish that they're watching, they're watching these two and that are yelltail or anything, whatever they're after. Um, they're watching as these fish come up, they're coming down to try and intersect and pick off that bait fish that fish is going to chase the surface. So if you see turns up high and they're shooting down and then shooting back up, there's feeding activity going on there even if you can't see it. Um, yeah, you know, uh, I had a very good question about <laughs> dolphin boaters where you see a lot of dolphin activity, but uh, Marks can pick his fish. Should you sus suspect fish or just move on? Um, a lot of times, dolphin will mark like tuna on your fish finder, but what you need to look for is marks that stay with you. Because what will happen is the dolphins move very fast, and you won't get those big clump marks. If you get those big clumpy marks, those big wormy I, clumps, I don't know how to describe. You're not looking at individual fish. You're looking at a group of fish. That's probably tuna. And uh, that's what we had going on um, at Catalina, where we knew there was fish there. We just didn't didn't know what kind they were. And you know, you could drop a flat full on there. Um, you can get ahead of the dolphins and throw a sardine. I got quite a fish the last couple, of, quite a few dolphin and bluefin doing that uh, last couple of years. Where if you see dolphin, just get up ahead of the leading edge and and drop a bait as they swim by you and. You know, this is this is gonna sound a little weird, but one of the ways that you can tell that dolphins have tuna on them if the dolphins slap their tail on the water a lot. And that was one of the things that got me to stay with them on Tuesday was they're doing this like kind of thing like this, where they're just spraying water, or they're once or twice hitting it real hard. I have no idea why they do that, but the only time I see dolphin doing that is when they have tuna on. So, you know, just something to put in the back of your mind next time you're out there, you might uh, might be able to make something out of that. Um I had another raised hand. If you have a question, uh, you need to just click on the Q&A button and type in your question. I'm happy to answer it. Um, so signs of life, dolphins, whales, birds, uh, kelp patties, obviously. You know, and so if you, if you have a, a skip as opposed to a yacht um, and you don't have one of these new fish finders that have side vision or side imaging, Lorance, Hummingbird, I've Rain Marine, they all have it now. Next time you update your fish finder, if you're an offshore guy, definitely pick it up. Um, I was out Saturday, last a week ago Saturday, and I can set my side view on my Rain Marine up to 600 feet on each side of the boat. And, and if I saw patties, a lot of times the fish aren't necessarily right on the patty. They're, you imagine, oh, they're right under it, I can see them in the water. A lot of times they're just, the, the patty attracts bait. The fish are peripherally hanging out with the bait that's hanging out with the patty. Um, I mark fish two or 300 feet off the side of the patty with uh, my side imaging. And I stayed there long enough that we had a 25 pound yellow come out of nowhere and follow a jig in a couple of times. That's when we saw the big tuna later. But um, don't be afraid to use that. I mean, it's a great tool. Every time I go by a patty now, I just look and I can say, hey, there's bait under it. You don't even have to drive close to it. You don't have to scare anything off. I can drive by a patty at five or six miles an hour, 200 feet off the side of it, and tell you if there's anything under it. And that saves you a ton of time. If there's no bait, there's not going to be any fish. You know, so, uh, or there might be one or two fish, but if there's enough fish to want to stop a catch, you're also going to meet those fish. I mean, your yellows too and everything on that side imaging. So, Learn how to use that. 
But um, when you're looking around in these areas and you find signs of life and you see a particular sign of life like dolphins, um, yeah, so Rich uh, asked if bluefin are not typically not with dolphins. The yellowfin are usually always the tuna that are on them. I've had uh, three occasions in the last three years that I've seen bluefin on the uh, on the dolphins, and uh, it's just unusual. You know, I think that I, I think that yellowfin travel with dolphins to feed. I think that bluefin and dolphin just happen to be in the same place feeding at the same time sometimes. So I don't think they really associate it with uh, with it as much. Um, but so let's say you get to an area and you see some birds working, like these turns here. If you saw this many turns, you're, there's something good going to happen. But let's say you see two or three, and they're looking and they're flying and they're taking off. And that's one of the things we had down uh, uh, the 371 the other day. There'd be two or three turns to get together. They'd come down, they'd work real hard. A tuna would boil, but then they'd break apart. You couldn't even get to them in time, and then it'd be gone. And then it'd be like 200 yards that way, and they'd come together. Um, you can really burn your entire day chasing stuff like that, and you're probably not going to catch anything unless something changes. And the things that change, the only thing that changes offshore is the tide. Um, you know, and I fish in the marlin terms and stuff, and fishing a lot more experienced offshore guys than I am. Um, tide changes are when things happen on the surface. Uh, last year's bluefin were a prime example. At slack high, slack low, you could see nothing all day and it's just foamers as far as you can see in every direction. Uh, marlin fish, it's the same way, everything. If you're in an area, and that's why I'm always very conscious of what, what time exactly the tides are when I'm heading out. A lot of times, like when I went out uh, Tuesday or Wednesday, we went in the afternoon because the high tide was there, the low tide was at three o'clock, which correlated with the time of day the fish have been biting, getting a little sun on them, hopefully. We didn't, I think our problem wouldn't have any sun. We just had a real heavy overcast all day. But you get sun, you get a slack tide, everything, you know, they, they call it float, the bait floats. I, I don't know that that's really a good indication of it. But um, so uh, as far as the uh, speed when using the side imaging uh, or the up and down, um, you know, uh, as far as the other now, get yourself a through hole transducer if you can. Um, with the drag of the puck transducer right off the back of my boat, I would lose, depending on sea state, I mean, if I went much over 15 miles an hour, it would get blown out. Uh, I put a through hole transducer on, not very expensive. I can meter, you know, I was, I was running a Catalina and uh, ran over a cod spot, 400 feet of water, 40 miles an hour, and marked fish on it. So it's. Uh, yeah, and then the next question I have, yeah, that's per, yeah, that's exactly what we're talking about. Yeah, so the three quarter inch trips out of San Diego are coming in with very few bluefin tuna right now, but everybody's seeing fish. The, it is the amount of bait and the type of bait that they're on. They're on very small bait, and it's hard to pull off and pull them off. You know, on the, on Saturday, not this, a week ago Saturday, um, oh, I, there was a, a couple spots of tuna up, and I was kind of, the San Diego and I, I were hopscotching each other on them. And I got up on top of the birds that kind of look like the ones in the picture here. And there's fish busting. We're fishing poppers and stuff like that where it's, it's not, not happening. The fish are not interested at all. So we we're taking turns. The San Diego slid by me and he started throwing chum right off my stern and slipped a couple hundred yards. And the minute that chum hit the water, it just, we had a foamer in a line up his chum for hit the entire couple hundred yards where we're pulling our jigs through. 50 and 60 pound fish jumping out of the water, even bigger ones boiling, and they would not touch it. He slides up, the things go right through his boat, boil their work, they hook one that broke off, and then the fish just kept going. So they're not uh, not clued in. Uh, the vertical uh, vertical jigging, yeah, that's a that's a great way to catch them. Guys using the uh, Mario, the guys are using the uh, flat falls. Um, the uh, you know there's I, I think there's better jigs like the uh, the classic night jig which are the you know like the Shimano butterfly style things the uh, cut a lot of tune on those um, you know but uh, they work great so you know those are good on meter marks I wouldn't cast them out when the fish are up and the, one of the problems we've had in the last year or so is the fish aren't really getting under the boat unless you're on a sport boat and you got a bunch of chum in the water so Mario I hope that answers your question anyway so what it comes down to is uh, 
get back up a little bit here. You know, you need to if you're on fish and they're acting the same way consistently for let's say a half an hour or 45 minutes, and if that consistent way means you're not catching them, you need to just go do something else. Or you can spend a whole day there and still catch absolutely nothing and just be frustrated. So the finding signs of life also means ruling out certain signs of life. You know, the question earlier about the dolphin, if you see uh, and sorry, Eric, yes, uh, the combo of transducer with the side scan. I know I have the side scan off the back of the boat right now and the through hole transducer on the up and down. Um, you can get a side scan through hole, but it, depending on the uh, uh, dead rise of the boat, you might have to get two, one for each side of the keel. Um, boy, I lost my train of thought. Oh, yeah, anyway. Um, so sometimes you have to drive away from fish to, to, catch, to find fish you might catch. And that's one of the toughest things that guys have when they're not super confident in offshore fishing. I've burned plenty of days uh, doing that very thing. Um, you know, and this brings me right to the choosing the appropriate technique for the situation you're in. Um, this picture was from... Uh, Two years ago, uh, Jimmy Decker and I went out to, uh, there's a funny short story here. I was writing an article for Sport Fishing Magazine about the uh, the big El Nino we had and how it changed all the fishing for the better and all that stuff. And I wanted to go out and try and at least troll for Wahoo, hopefully maybe catch one, uh, to take a picture for for the article. And I, I called Jimmy. He was getting ready to leave for Cabo for a month the next day. He's like, go out for like four hours on Thursday morning or something. So we left Newport Harbor at like 8.30, and by I think 9.15, we had a, like a 40-pound wahoo on a kelp pad on a troll. <laughs> it was pretty awesome. We went out and trolled Blue Marlin at the Avalon Bank, and the boat next to us hooked one, which is, I don't think any of us will ever see any of that again. But, um, you know, talking about trolling, um, and I chose this picture because this is this covers a couple bases. A lot of guys say, you know, if uh, if you're trolling, you know, have, what do you do when you stop a fish kelp patty or things like that? You don't. You just troll right by it and just drag those jigs right by the edge of it. See, he kind of did a left turn there. Yeah, and just pulled it right by there. That's going to tell you everything you want to know. If there's tuna, yellowfin, dorado, whatever, they're going to jump on that jig the minute it goes by. Try and have clean water on the patty when you're doing it. So don't uh, don't chop it up as you go by. You can see here he has an outrigger on his, uh, his boat. Uh, if you troll a lot, get one. If you don't, it's just a pain in the ass. As is trolling, by the way. Um, you know, there's uh, there was a question earlier about uh, trolling like an x wrap or things like that for tuna. Um, the minute you put something behind the boat, you have to slow down, and you're just burning your day like nobody's business. If the fish are biting the troll, I would not put the trolling jigs out until I saw active fish or birds on the surface like I'm about to catch one and if I don't catch one in like 20 minutes I'm pulling a trolling gear in and going to do something else these things are absolute time vampires so are stopping on patties and let me soak a bait here hoping that something's gonna be on it. yeah you know if you don't there's very few times where you pull up to a patty and you don't get bit if you, if you let's say you don't get it on the first trip you go back two or three more drifts and catch one it ain't happening so the key to offshore fishing is trying to fish as fast as possible and cover as much water as possible, but still do it effectively. So let's talk about the fishing we have going on right now here in Southern California. Bluefin tuna, the occasional yellowfin tuna, small yellowtail, um, a few really big yellowtail. Uh, It, you know, I've been going out. I don't take a tank of bait. Um, in a couple more months, I'll take some mackerel in case there's a marlin that shows up. But Or, you know, if the yellowfin start biting regulation on bait stops, I would bring a tank of bait. But bringing a tank of bait on most boats just slows you down because you tend to waste a lot of your day fishing bait, chumming, trying to keep your bait alive when it's rough. All these other things. And yeah, Mario, yeah, service lures all the time. We're, we're doing poppers, subservice, uh, stick baits, uh, service iron, uh, build, uh, 
jerk baits like a Lucky Craft 190, uh, Rapala long cast, all these types of lures. Um, what will happen, like, so, like, right now, these tuna, you know, basically, you just need a tuna to open its mouth when your lure is by it, and it probably won't be eating your lure. A lot of the big bluefin that were caught last year, the poppers and everything else, were just guys would cast their lure into a foamer, and it's basically they'd sit there and a tuna would come over, and it would eat it, and it would take off, and they would hope that another tuna didn't come by with its mouth open and bite your line off on the way past. Um, there you go. Uh, the, uh, so... The trick is to successful offshore fishing is finding these fish. I guarantee you that no tuna you encounter or yellowtail you encounter, dorado you encounter offshore has ever seen another artificial lure. So they're not going to be like, oh, you know, I'm not going to bite that. Um, they're not some white sea bass or, or you name it that's very leery of biting stuff. If they're feeding, they're going to bite whatever you have out there. Um, you know, and you know, in the days when those yellowfin, like two years ago, where they would just stack up, and you sit there and you chunk bait, and I mean, they're eating the chunks, you put a chunk in your hook. I mean, that's if you guys are curious about how to do that type of stuff, just go to any of the fishing websites, uh, Flight Decks, uh, and Google chunk yellowfin, and you're going to find a million stories and reports on how guys are getting those fish. So, I'm not going to really burn any time on it, but um, yeah, so like right now, um, I threw every possible lure at these bluefin and caught none of them. Um, the fish that have been caught just happened to be fish that were in the process of eating something else when the lure came by and they ate it as well. I don't, there's no hot lure, you know, unless you go out there and fly a gummy flyer all day. Um, that's something I want to bring up real quick here because a lot of guys are into that mode right now. If you want to go fish a gummy flyer for tuna, you really need to think long and hard about it because it's an investment. You have to buy quite a bit of tackle and uh, kites and all this other heavy gear. And it is so boring, it will blow your mind. You know, after like an hour, you'll just want to just quit and go home. So it's great. You see the pictures of the guys with the 200 pounders, but the fun level on that is like zero. And then once you do it, when all is stressful because you're afraid you're going to lose the whole time, and it's really not an enjoyable thing. And only one person gets to fight it. So, yeah, it's not really my thing. Um, so, I've covered everything I have to cover here, and I hope I answered most questions. But i got about another 10 minutes if anybody has any particular questions they'd like to ask um, about anything I may or may not have covered uh, or go back over something that I did cover. So, now would be a good time to type in your question. Can you go fishing with me? Yeah, you know I get a lot of uh, a lot of asks, and uh, I have very limited time. But thanks for the. Uh, I'll keep you in mind if uh, if I have an opening. <laughs> um, as far as the side of the temperate, I, I'll normally uh, fish the side of the temperate that has the signs of life on it. And so the, the question is, do you fish the water or the cool side of the temperate? Um, it will tell you. Hey, it's you know you'll you'll see birds, you'll see light, you'll see bait, you'll see meter marks on one side or the other. Uh, let the fish tell you on any on any given uh, at any given time. Um, as far as gear that I'm using for the service lures, um, I'm a pen guy. I fish a pen Fathom 25 and Star Drag reel with 80 pound spectra. I use a 80 or 130 pound fluorocarbon leader crimped to whatever lure I'm using, and um, I know it's a small reel, but it's easier to cast with. And I tend to also, when I hook these bigger bluefin, I will usually be not the person personally to hook them. But if I am, when I get the fish up and down, I will pass the rod to one of the other guys in the boat. And I will use the boat to spin the fish up and get it quicker, so you don't have to have the the really uh, the real heavy gear. And uh, you don't want too long a rod. You know, if you're on a sport boat, get one of the ten foot rods. But if you're on a skiff, um, I'd go with an eight-foot rod. We had a uh, last year. We had about an eighty-pound bluefin that my partner Mac got on a ten-foot jig stick. It was very stiff. We got the thing to color, and so he, the, 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 it was so far away from the boat. The gap only had six-foot gap or four-foot gap. I actually had to have him go to the other side of the boat just so I could reach out and gap the thing. Um, oh yes, and anybody that's asking that uh, that log in late, um, there will be a YouTube video up. Um, on the Navionics webpage in about a week. You can just Google 
Navi or go to YouTube, Navionics webinar, uh, Eric Landis find it'll come up. Um, I got a lot of questions here. Okay, so um, as far as the app I use for SST and chlorophyll, I use Fishto. Uh, I hear good things about Terrafin, but the advantage of Fishto is they also get information about where uh, what's biting and and uh, where fish have been biting, which is really handy if you can't get out very often. Um, I have a question about the tactics to catch tuna. Uh, vastly different from uh, the the past El Nino period. You know, it's funny. I, I everybody thinks this this kite fishing and all this stuff is a, a new thing out here. I was reading a a book from 1949, uh, California saltwater fishes. Uh, they were talking about uh, the guys back in the early 1900s flying a kite with a rig of flying fish off the east end of Catalina for big bluefin. So, um, as far as the numbers of the spots goes, 302, 43, uh, most of those are, are how, how many fathoms deep those, those banks are. Some like the 14 mile bank is a distance. Um, I don't know that, uh, that the question is, uh, spots where under can underwater canyons end, do you think the incoming or outgoing tide makes a difference or just any current? I don't think that the tide has as big of an effect out in those outer waters as it does with the peaks and, uh, and lows. Um, as far as uh, I'm getting a lot of questions here. Sorry, um, I don't. As far as favorite surface temps to fish, uh, anything over 63 degrees is game on for tuna. We had yellowfin, 40 to 60 pound yellowfin in 63 degree water the other day. It really varies about what's going on. Um, I next question. I do have the uh, Fujinon Techno Stabbies. Um, when I'm driving around, I will drive. I'm looking. I'll drive for three or four minutes. I never drive faster than 20 miles an hour. When I'm looking offshore, you'll miss stuff if you're going too fast. I'll drive for five minutes, ten minutes. You can see about two or three miles actively. So I'll drive about two or three miles, stop, glass again. Um, next question. Uh, charts that show ridges and rapid rises and drop off. Um, you, you know, there, there's very few charts that you uh, that you would want to anchor up on, or at, uh, sorry, uh, banks you want to anchor up. Last year we had that, that bluefin bite out at the uh, uh, Desperation Reef, where the guys were deep water anchoring up on that. Um, the trolling motor with the GPS, I wouldn't use for this um, unless you're in a place like Desperation Reef where you're trying to set them. Uh, my friend Jerry made you a good success using his uh, motor guide to anchor, digitally anchor 600 feet of water and catch bluefin. Um, okay, so I have a question about uh, boat positioning when you're pulling up on visual fish. Um, you don't ever want to pull up on visual fish so much as you want to uh, drive up past them on the outside and let them come to you. If you're trying to pull up on fish, they're going to be, you're going to be chasing away from you more often than not. So if I see some fish that are up, I will drive 100 plus yards off the side of them and I'll figure out what direction they're going. Drive a couple hundred, maybe 100 to 200 yards off the side of them at, at full speed, you know, 40 miles an hour. Get up past them. Cut the boat maybe a couple hundred yards ahead of them, get my boat pointed at them, and if they just so I can see if they're gonna change direction, and that way I can bump the boat either way. Otherwise, I'll just slide and I have a four stroke, which is quiet. I'll just idle up and pull it out of gear when they're you know couple, three times out of casting range and then let them have it. Um, regarding moon phase, uh, things change on a full moon, things change on a new moon. Uh, middle moon phases are the most stable. Um, if you're going out the day after a full or new moon, you can expect things to be different. Um, they may not be, but more often than not, they will be. Uh, the last couple of years, the fish have been biting better on the full moon and the new moon, so that seems to be continuing. That's one of the reasons I went out on Wednesday as well, because we had a full moon that night, and it turned out they been the night before the full moon uh, of the Catholic. So, uh, you know, I want to thank everybody for uh, for joining me tonight. I'm running out of time.